Hello, Houston. We're going to re-enter childhood. We uh, kind of fumbled through the beginning of it last time, so I want to make sure that we went back and put it in context for you. Going directly to PowerPoint, we're going to do uh, childhood now, basically two to, um, to puberty. And in fact, start with an assessment of the activities of uh, the ethologists in, the, in their early work. These were uh, a group of people who came to us from biology um, and they were basically looking for, they were studying, they were using very sophisticated naturalistic observation techniques, but what they were looking for were the underlying biological explanations for various kinds of particularly automated behaviors, several of which we're going to look at um, here today. Um, in essence, one of the first that they talked about is, or, or studied, I should say, is imprinting. Imprinting is defined, as you can uh, see on the screen here, as simply the tendency of organisms to follow the first moving thing that they see. At least that was the original definition of the, um, of the concept. And the ethologists, as they got into this work, gradually began to realize that there were um, some other um, functions that, that might in fact work, but, but, or that might be going on here. But the early work was done by Conrad Lorenz way back in the mid-1930s. And he basically developed an analysis of animal behavior by studying geese. And what he did in his classic studies was to basically remove goslings from mother goose as soon as they were born. And then he raised them. He provided food. He showed them swimming and so forth and so on. And, and pretty soon what happened was they became mom. They became super mom. They became the only thing they would follow. Um, he became the only thing they would follow. And so the net result was if he swam, they swam. If he went walking, they went walking. If he nuzzled the ground looking for food, they nuzzled the ground looking for food. And they were then, in fact, totally imprinted on him. <coughs> now, about 30, uh, that was basically the way it was published in the mid-30s, that imprinting is essentially an all-or-none lock-in process by which parents or, or children are bonded to their, uh, attached to their parents. And then all of a sudden, Eckerd Hess at the University of Chicago in the 1960s began questioning and, and wondering about whether this was, in fact, what had actually happened. And so he set about to break apart all of the different elements, try to identify the contributing elements to this imprinting process that, that had been announced and discovered, discovered and announced. One of the things he looked at was the fact that, that mother geese always knows their eggs, that is, they turn them or move them every now and then. What if a human did that instead? Uh, another thing that mother geese do is honk. That is, when they're, when they're nesting on uh, cooking their infants before birth, they honk a lot, they vocalize. What happens if that's muted? So they tried a situation where they, where they clamped the, the beak of the goose, the mother goose, so that it could not honk. It could still breathe, and it was fine, but it could not, in fact, honk. And what was able to be identified, in fact, one of the classic, one of the interesting studies involved actually the use of a gooseneck trailer, if we can call it that, um, in which half of the goslings were removed from mother and put into a trailer. That is, once, the, once they were hatched, they were put into a gooseneck trailer that literally was clamped around the neck, loosely around the neck of mother goose. The result being that any time she moved anywhere, this little trailer of, of goslings followed right along behind her. And so they still had, you know, they had the, the normal view of the rear end of mom waddling back and forth, uh, but they didn't have, to actually, didn't have to actually exert any physical energy to keep up with her. The other half of that, that uh, brood did have to. That is, they had to actually struggle on their own mini geese feet um, to keep up with mom. And it turned out those were the goslings that were more strongly imprinted to her. That is, they were more distressed when, when separated from her than were the ones that had waddled around all along. So it wasn't necessarily the view that was so important as the effort that went into maintaining that view that led to uh, the strongest imprinting. And got, um, Hess was actually able to, to separate out, parse out all of these different um, elements and demonstrate that each of them contributed at least partially to, to imprinting. That led ultimately to the crucial experiment. And the crucial experiment was essentially looking at Okay, let's take a group of goslings as they hatch, and we're going to divide them in half. This particular brood had eight goslings that was used. Four of them were left with Mother Goose for several months. The other four were taken over by Eckerd Hess, the professor at the University of Chicago, and he became Mother Goose for them. Fed them, nursed them, watered them, did anything that was necessary to, to become mother to them. After three or four months of this, then what they did was to swap. The, the four goslings that had been with Hess were given back to Mother Goose, and the four that had been with Mother Goose were taken over by Hess. So essentially, we simply swapped. Did that for another month, 
And then came the crucial experiment. Now what they did in a large room was to put the goslings at the far end. They put Hess on one side and Mother Goose on the other side. I guess everything's on camera here now. Okay, so Hess is over here, Mother Goose is over here, and all eight goslings are released. The question is, to whom will the goslings go? And what they found was, now keep in mind, this was three or four months with the original figure, a month with, with the alternate figure, and then both figures are present. Who are you going to choose? The goslings that had originally been raised by Mother Goose went to Mother Goose. Interestingly, the goslings that had originally been raised by, by Professor Hess, and for whom he was mother for the first several months, went to Mother Goose. So the point is that, that the, the modern day understanding of imprinting is now that it is a reversible or correctable all or none process, which if you think about it makes sense. Because if a piece of paper happens to blow through the barnyard at the right time and a goose gets imprinted on it, it's going to follow that piece of paper to its death. So in fact you do need a potentially correctable process and it turns out imprinting is. that If it occurs correctly, the imprinting remains, but if it doesn't occur correctly, uh, the imprinting will in fact self-correct when the correct mother um, comes, to, uh, comes into uh, view. Another process that we can also look at, in addition to imprinting, is a concept called critical period, which comes out of the work of the ethologists. One of the questions that was raised in the, in the imprinting literature had to do with, is there a particular time interval during which this imprinting is most, like to, most likely to occur? And the answer turns out to be, yes, there is. Um, the point is that, that it looks like this for goslings. That is, that there's about a four hour interval, 13 to 16 hours after birth, um, in which imprinting is most likely to occur. There seem to be two processes that account for why that occurs in that situation. First of all, attraction or curiosity is, is kind of in decline at, at this point. Um, probably because the infants have, have learned that, that not everything that moves is necessarily interesting simply by virtue of moving. And at the same time, fear may be too strong a word, but certainly caution is growing. In, during that same interval. So there turns out to be a window of opportunity um, about 13 to 16 hours after birth when imprinting is in fact most likely to occur, apparently resulting from the combined effects of these two other processes which are in one case growing and in the other case declining um, at essentially the same time. So this in turn led to the, the concept of, of uh, a critical period and it does seem to apply to, to uh, imprinting. There's a related process that we can also talk about, and that is what's called maturational readiness. Maturational readiness refers to essentially the time in the development or, or maturation of an organ, organism when it is most likely to be sensitive to or responsive to new experiences. We can tie this directly to humans very easily with things like reading. And it turns out that for reading, there's a very specific response as to when is the best time to actually teach an infant to read. And that is shown by, by this particular uh, graph. What this demonstrates is that, that humans experience a point of maturational readiness relative to preparation for reading at the age of about, at the mental age of about five and a half. We're going to talk about that more later, but essentially what mental age refers to is the average age level of the person who can do any particular skill. Or the other way to put it is the average skills that a person is capable of at any particular age. And so in terms of reading, it is best if we implement it or start training in reading at about age five and a half. That turns out to be a reasonably important process. A number of years ago, I had a, um, a neighbor uh, who had a son who somehow she discovered was bright. That is, he was tested at age three or four, and she was announcing widely around the neighborhood that in fact his IQ was somewhere around 130, i.e. that he was quite bright. What this woman did was to implement a reading, train, a, a reading program for her youngster without any particular help from a psychologist. And what she did basically was to have two hours of reading every single day. Didn't matter whether that youngster was playing in the neighborhood, uh, happily doing something on his own, whatever. He was put into a reading activity which ran for two hours by mother's insistence every single day. Initially he was being read to, later it was kind of cooperative reading, and eventually the youngster was responsible for doing the reading all by himself. Two hours a day, seven days a week. The result was that by age five, six, he had read all of the standard childhood classics, um, War and Peace, 
crime and punishment, I mean all the ones that we kind of blow through by, by um, first grade, um, and he entered school. By fourth grade, he had topped out on the reading class. As I remember, he entered at something like sixth grade reading level when he entered uh, first grade. And by fourth grade, he had topped out of the charts. He was reading beyond 12th grade level at that point. The ancillary effects of that training were particularly ineffective. He was socially very insensitive. He was an, an, an uneasy child to interact with, first of all. Secondly, um, he was way behind in math in the physical sciences, in the social sciences, in, in writing and English, and so forth. The net lesson was that by, by fourth grade he was so unbalanced, if you want to use that word, in terms of his, his various excellences, um, that they had to put him into a, um, uh, a learning resources center. And basically for two years they did no reading with him at all, other than as was related to whatever activities he was involved in, so that they could bring the math and, and the physical sciences and the social sciences up into the general region of where typical fourth graders were. So the net effect of all that reading training was to seriously disbalance him. And, and the, the bottom line lesson out of that is to come back to the lesson of maturational readiness. And that is that there is a point at which training is effective. But if you try to force it, that is if you try to take a skill that the child is not naturally ready to do yet and do it too early, you're going to spend a disproportionate amount of time trying to, to achieve excellence in that activity. You can do it, but the question is at what cost? And in, in many instances I think it's better if you watch a child, um, he or she will let you know when they're basically ready to, to read. I mean by the time he was into, now I tease about war and peace, but by the time he entered kindergarten, my two youngsters of similar age were kind of like, duh, books. Um, but one of them ended up a PhD and the other ended up an MD, now practicing. So um, you can survive a delay in the introduction to reading uh, until natural interests uh, tend, to, um, tend to suggest it would be appropriate to do so. There's a related effort here, and that has to do, or a related series of processes that, that are also interesting to look at. One is physical training. Uh, to what extent uh, do we need to learn to walk when we reach age one, which is the age that most uh, middle class, lower and upper, middle, upper, upper class um, um, citizens in the U.S. tend to achieve walking. There's one very interesting natural experiment that has been done over the years with Native Americans in this country. Indians, American Indians, traditionally tend to keep their children in papoose in some tribes. And, and the custom is that the babysitting is the child is wrapped up and is on mom's back, so she always knows where it is. The only potentially adverse consequence of that is the infant doesn't get to walk because in fact it is often when it's not on mom's back it simply remains in the papoose leaning up in the corner of the teepee or the, or the lodge wherever it is. The obvious question is that if, if they're kept in there until say age two or three is there any obvious retarding of their ability to learn to walk? And the answer is basically no. If you compare a, a, an infant recently released from the papoose among the Native American tribe um, then yes, they will not have the physical skills that the standard white or black or Hispanic in this country does, youngster of the same age. But by the time you reach age five or six, all physical differences have, uh, have disappeared. So in fact, that's one where, where a delay, to a certain extent, is not a problem. There's another set of data that seems to bear on this issue, which in fact doesn't, and that is what are called feral children, F-E-R-A-L. One of the more recent examples of which uh, appeared in the literature as the wild boy of Averon a number of years ago. This was a youngster that, that was found um, in the woods, and it happens about every decade or two, where a youngster is found having been raised entirely by animals rather than humans. And what you normally find is a youngster who's walking around on all fours with no language skills at all. When they're brought back into society or into human society, there has been very minimal success in teaching them language. Almost no one has succeeded in that. And with walking, as another example of a motor skill that you might want to train these youngsters in, some are not even recovered until age 10 or 11, estimated age 10 or 11. Um, they can be taught to stand, and in fact they can be taught to walk. But without exception, if they have to move rapidly from one point to another, they get back down on all fours and do it on hands and knees, and quite rapidly. So they have, of course, massive calluses on their, on their knees. But the, the evidence then suggests that, that um, or would seem to suggest, that walking does seem to experience a critical period, or, or a, I should say a point of maturational readiness, and potentially a critical period. I'm going to back off on that second statement, though, because of two obvious problems if you think about the problems of, of feral children. 
One is, it may well be in some societies that a, that a child who is obviously flawed in some way, intellectually slow or, or with a physical abnormality of some sort, is simply summarily rejected by the family and may thus have been taken over by, by parents. Alternatively, I think we could legitimately question the intelligence of parents who would, who would let any child be taken over by, by children. And given the inability to know what actually happened back in family situation, um, there's no essential way for us to know for sure what's actually happened in the, um, in the training situation uh, originally. So we don't tend to concentrate a great deal on the, um, on the feral children. The literature looks interesting, it just doesn't tend to, to help us very much. Now let's go back to the screen that I messed up there for a minute. It, but we're back on it again here now and look at emotional development in children. There is an amazing array of, um, of emotions which develop and if we've got a nice graphic slide we can put it in there and otherwise we'll just skip that for now. But in essence this ta-da, every now and then the technology works when they and me actually communicate effectively. Um, what you see here is kind of an estimate as to when the major emotions in a child tend to develop. Um, but very early on in a, in a child's birth, um, life I should say, you begin to understand when they're happy and when they're not happy. What amazes me is the uh, staggering array of negative emotions the child end up, end up uh, developing. Anger and, and uh, fear and envy and jealousy and you name it, the full array is there uh, fairly early on in, in, a, um, in a child's life. And we're looking there at months, not years, so that these are separate emotions that develop quite rapidly in a, um, in a youngster. You're going to notice that there's a marked increase in the diversity of emotions as a child ages. Um, there's going to be an increase in the intensity. I mean, you've seen nothing until you've seen a five-year-old who is truly centrally angry. That is a very intense emotional experience to, to watch being expressed. The diversity of emotions increases, the range and ability to express them uh, increases. And one of the major things that children are actually working on is learning to control their emotions, to express them at a proper level and to the proper person. I think even more interesting with, with children is, is studying the development of, um, of social uh, behavior. And specifically in terms of social development, let's look at, at play. One of the difficulties that we've had with play is actually defining what we mean by play. One group of investigators defined it as whatever children do that cannot be considered as the serious business of life. Sleeping, eating, eliminating. The developmental psychologists who were associated with that definition are internationally known. But if that's the best they can do by way of defining play, let me suggest to you one of the problems. A number of years ago, I was visiting a female colleague and a, a, a fellow faculty member in psychology. I'd gone to her house to, to give her a report that we were working on. She was in the kitchen at 5 or 5.30 in the afternoon when I got there uh, preparing supper for her family. She had a four-year-old daughter who was over in the corner of the kitchen in a play area assembling a table with a friend and they were getting out teacups and, and uh, Kool-Aid and, and um, you know brownies and they were going to do a, a picnic of some sort. And at one point my colleague turned to her daughter and said, Melissa, I'm glad to see you're having fun playing with Maria. And Melissa rose up to her entire three foot two and said, oh, we're not playing, we're getting ready to play. So I would suggest that children have a more sophisticated understanding of what really constitutes play. I think that definition is a little bit too inclusive, um, but it does involve an activity that children are naturally in, uh, involved in for sure. And in essence, when we look at play among children, one of the things I want to do is to show you a really interesting descriptive study that was done a number of years ago trying to spell out various types of play. One of the types of play that tends to show up earliest, and these are in roughly chronological order, is what I'm going to call unoccupied play. This is what an, an infant will do in a crib. If it's simply lying there with nothing else around it, it will pinch itself, it'll pinch the blanket, it'll pinch things that hurt, pinch things that feel good, and so forth and so on. But it's basically unoccupied behavior. It's the kind of thing that goes on if there's nothing else to do. And a lot of it involves basically self-exploration, simply learning uh, about oneself. This in turn is followed by solitary play. Um, my now 12 year old whom you met um, in the previous lecture, uh, when he was about age two, uh, I could entertain for hours because we had bought a house uh, when he was about two that was a fixer upper. Um, the to-do list at that time for the house was about five years long and it's not clear to me I'm ever going to catch up with it because it's still about five years long at this point. But the work is at least a little different. I used to be out in the garage on weekends doing a lot of different things, whether wiring or plumbing or you haven't. Um, I could take Vijay out with me 
put down a blanket or something that was comfortable to sit on, give him three or four tools and some blocks of wood, he could be entertained for hours, doing not hours, but at least a couple of hours, um, doing that without any problem at all. And in essence, what you were seeing there is solitary play. He would take the pliers and mash his fingers and scream and learn, among other things, don't put your finger in pliers and, and so forth. But um, it was very much a learning experience for him. And he could be perfectly happy doing that for several hours at a time, as he could really, as any child could with any activity in which they're interesting and, and which is educating them. Um, the third stage is very frustrating for parents. And that's what's called onlooker play. Onlooker play is vital for children. When they see or get involved in a new game like, like um, 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 kickball, your parent, as, as a parent, you want them to get in immediately, be a leader and kick the home run and so forth and so on. Kids won't do that. They want to stand beside the field and watch what's going on to see what constitutes effective play, understand what the leaders do, see what skills are required in order to handle that, uh, that game properly. And so the net result is that they will, they will onlook before they will actually participate in a, um, in a game. This in turn leads to a series of, of types of play that are related to one another, as you'll see here in a minute. One of them is what we'll call parallel play. If you put two kids and a bunch of toys in a sandbox at the right age, what will happen is you will see parallel play. That is, they're both playing with essentially the same toys, but there's basically no exchange of goods and services between them. They are literally playing in parallel. So if one of the children happens to be removed or, or taken away from the situation, it basically doesn't impact the play of the other one at all, because they were literally playing in parallel. This is followed then by a, another form of play called associative play. In associative play, what you'll have is a kind of a partial exchange of goods and services. In that case, if they've got an electric train or they've got a set of toys or something, particularly with the toys, if they're out in the sandbox, they may develop a very elaborate village with roads and tunnels and everything else, working to a certain extent together. Uh, although one area will tend to be more developed by the one child and the other by the other. Um, and you'll see a certain amount of exchange of, of goods and services. Things that happen in one area may or may not impact what's going on in the other area. But if they don't impact it, it's not a particularly unusual problem for the, um, for the, um, for the play of, of the other child. The final type of play is what we call cooperative play. Here's what you have when, when you're looking at uh, uh, things like hide and seek, a, a totally interactive kind of game. It's a single activity. It involves the same materials. And in essence, um, it, it involves potentially a large number of children. But if you can think back to hide and seek in, in your neighborhood, if you ever played that, it always involves one person who is it, whose responsibility is to search out and find the other youngsters who are hidden out around in the neighborhood. And if the it person decides the only way to win is to get out and tag somebody, which of course is the goal, they may get far enough from the base that some other player is, is tempted to make a run for the, um, for the base. And in fact, if there's any close activity regarding whether the it person gets back to tag them or not, they're of course going to scream, gotcha, you're it. And you, or the person who's running back, is going to say something equally helpful like, um, your mother wears combat boots. And what will precipitate out of that, typically, is a very long and detailed discussion about the rules of the game. And therein lies the value of, um, of play. That in essence, when we are playing, um, what we're doing is, is participating in things where rules become increasingly important as we age. Um, but it's a low-cost threat. That is, if, if you are it, if you're not it, really doesn't matter at, at some level. There's no ultimate cost to, um, to doing that. Uh, and so in, in one sense, we can, we can talk about play without, um, without um, or we can engage in play without actually worrying about, uh, without actually worrying about the, um, the, the cost to the, uh, to the individual uh, in, that, um, in that situation. So in essence, um, the reason I'm out wandering around the booth is that I wanted to um, show you another curve here in just a minute, and I wanted to be prepared to have a, something to actually show you, so I borrowed a book. Let's jump now into looking at um, adolescence, and it's going to take me a second to get the right uh, computer screen on there, but we will, um, we will do that here, hopefully, uh, very shortly. I'm going to try a brand new system for bringing up another, um, another program, and then we'll put you on screen here. And now we're ready to go. So we'll talk now about adolescence, basically the age from 12 to 22. We run into an immediate problem with adolescence, 
and that is a definitional problem. You know, many of you in the viewing audience, having just gone through uh, escape from parent suppression um, into adulthood, that there is a very mixed set of responsibilities that are involved in being an adolescent. And, and even quite recently, there have probably been situations where you were treated almost like a child in some ways, and the expectations were very low, and it was, oh no, I'll do this, or that, or the other thing. Um, and yet other situations where you expect to perform totally as an adult, fully responsible for what you were doing, and so forth. The point being that, in essence, what that leads to is a definitional problem. And when we start talking about adolescence, we run into some very interesting difficulties in trying to define what it is that we're actually doing. One of the ways to define adolescence is to define it biologically. And when we do that, we tend to do something like defining it as the years of, of life between the puberty and the ceasing of bone growth. Those are two biological markers that are sometimes cited for the beginning and the end of adolescence. The difficulty being, that there are gray borders on both of those. Because when, when we humans reach puberty, are we really talking about the onset or, or the completion of puberty as the beginning of adolescence? What most people tend to mean when they talk about the beginning of puberty is uh, ejaculation for little boys becoming men and menstruation for little girls becoming women. However, if you really press people, what they really mean is the ability to reproduce. And that is not marked by the initial ejaculation or the initial period, usually. So there's a problem. There's a gray period of several months in there um, that, that, in fact, represent various stages of the beginning of, of puberty uh, or of puberty itself. Um, the one thing that I would drop in there with is, is the myth that a female cannot become pregnant on first, uh, first intercourse is simply not true. It's governed by age, not by, not by initial incident. Um, may I simply drop in? We've got a bigger problem at the other end, and that is that if we define the end of adolescence as the ceasing of bone growth, how old in the class here do you think the average human is when bone growth ceases? How old is the average human at the end of bone growth? 22. Actually, that's close, but it's actually older than that. It actually runs up to about 25. Witness the fact that when Hakeem Olajuwon was recruited uh, to the rockets um, from the University of Houston, um, his height at that time, and I can't remember the exact statistics, but as I remember, he was either 6'11", expected to reach 7 feet, or he was 7 feet, expected to reach 7 feet 1. I can no longer remember um, the exact figure. But the point was that when they announced his, his actual physical height, uh, it was part of the initial announcement that it was expected to go higher. And what was being reflected there is that they, of course, had years of data plotting his, uh, plotting his growth, and they could project how high he would ultimately be when he was fully mature. And in fact, that growth did occur and does occur in most of us. But if you want to look at the average 25-year-old and just call them a late adolescent, have at it. I don't think most adolescents will allow you to, um, to get away with that. So we've got an even bigger problem at the other end. And I would suggest that, that oftentimes we get tempted then to retreat instead into a psychological definition of, of, um, of adolescence. And there we've run into yet another problem. It kind of highlights the point that I was making earlier, and that is we can call it a time period of mixed responsibilities that shift gradually from being childlike to adult-like. But as you probably know, having gone through it in many instances in the room here not too long ago, it's really kind of a laminated process that's occurring. Sometimes you're expected to be a child. Sometimes you're expected to be an adult. Um, and so I think, in another way, the, the, the pragmatic way to define adolescence might be to simply talk instead about the teenage years. It, it's a bit of a cop-out, but it really boils down to, to almost that fact that what we're really talking about is, is from age 12 or 13 up to about 18 or 19. But when you're 11 or 12, you're very much still a child, even though that frustrates my now 12-year-old whom you met um, in the previous program. But certainly by the time you're 19 entering 20, you have every right to, be expect, uh, to expect to be treated like an adult. And yet you notice the state is very differential as to how it treats you. You, can, you can't buy a drink at one age, and yet you can be drafted. Um, so some ways you're still an adult, some ways you're still a child. And that really leads to a very complex definitional problem. But if we look at um, the facts of development, they fall out into, into two different groups of activities. One is the tasks that are faced by, by early adolescents, and those are very complex. One of them involves, for instance, bodily control. Early adolescents are just inherently clumsy, and you always tend to think of that, well, he's an adolescent, therefore he's clumsy. 
you and I are basically not responsible for that clumsiness when, when it occurs to us. What's happening there is that in a fairly short period of time, as we're going to see here shortly, we grow. And we may grow in some instances as much as a half an inch a day. It, it turns out it's not a smooth process where you increase and then, and then gradually fade out and you're at adult height. In some instances, there are long periods of inactivity followed by a half inch growth in height literally in a day, literally in a day. But the net result is that over a very short period of time, a year or two, the communication links between your, your head and your feet have extended as much as a foot or more. And the result is the timing relationships are thrown off. A 12-year-old, my son, can very gracefully climb a set of stairs. In fact, we race downstairs sometimes, you know, just who can get down faster. Very coordinated. Another year or two when he gets into uh, young adolescence, I probably won't be doing that with him because it can be a very dangerous time. The problem being that the signal that leaves here to lift your foot is timed very precisely in a 12-year-old as it is in him, and he's quite skilled physically. But now all of a sudden it takes a, just a split second, several milliseconds longer for the message to get down there. And what that means in some cases is the difference between a smooth implanting a foot on a step and tripping. And it's a double problem because the sensory message coming in takes, you know, has to go about a foot further and this, the control signal downbound also has to go about a foot further. So you've actually got a total of about two feet of additional neural communication that has to take place that youngsters really have to practice before they can manage properly. So achieving bodily control is not a trivial task in the growing adolescent. Peer identification is another thing. Your, your, um, your size um, may result in, in a very significant shift in groups. Suddenly older kids are willing to play with you if you look big um, than when you looked small. Um, Peer identification is, is going on, social sensitivity is increasing. All of a sudden, you remember we were talking the other day in, in another lecture about uh, increasing shift from, from self-centered to other-oriented. That's a whole new set of skills that have to be practiced to learn how to read signals from others and, and interact uh, properly in response to the incoming signals. You have to reorganize yourself. Your interests shift as, as things like sex and interest in sex begin to, to grow within you. Your cognitive increasing, your increasing cognitive skills lead to changes in attitudes, better ability to process information and so forth. And one of the most important things that we were talking about in emotions a little earlier is self-control. Ever get told, act your age? What they probably did was confound your size with your age. Because in fact all of us are, by definition, acting our age. But it's whether we're acting our size that becomes the issue sometimes. We then have also a set of other tasks that we have to handle in middle and late adolescence. In middle and late adolescence, what we're looking at is, is further increase in self-awareness and self-reliance. I can remember a kind of lonely train ride I took one time from Schenectady, New York, where I went to high school, to Rochester, the University of Rochester, which was my undergraduate school, as I kind of thought and sat there for three or four hours, just kind of thinking through all the things I no longer had at the university. Now at the U of H, where, where it's a, an off-campus uh, commuter school, that isn't quite such a problem. The, the change that many of you go through is much more gradual. But for a number of people, as they get married, as they get a job away from home, as they go to school away from home, that can be a very abrupt change. And it's a significant loss of a number of things that you've just kind of always taken for granted. It's a real stinger to have to wash your own clothes, isn't it? <laughs> um, emotional independence from parents is also it's, it's, it's forced on you in some ways, but you're more than ready for it by late adolescence anyway. That also you have to manage, and, and then also strengthening of self-control. Um, we do come to expect um, that freshmen are, are going to act up and have some difficulty occasionally here. Um, it does happen by virtue of, of, um, of, of just the fact that, that you're on your own all of a sudden, and, and sometimes it takes us a while. We tend to act out more than perhaps we should. Um, and so in, you know, we're not surprised at all that, that freshmen have a, um, um, you know, sometimes lower grades than they end up with. Almost without exception, a student's grades will climb during college because in essence what's happening is you're getting better control over, first of all, what your major is, what your interests are, and what your abilities are. And you, as you grow in that knowledge, you tend to move more and more toward the, the whatever your intended major ultimately should become. So there are a lot of responsibilities going on in, in middle, late adolescence. Now what I want to do is to shift to an overhead of the physical changes that are going on here uh, and just concentrate on this area of the, um, of the book on the overhead camera and show you what's in your uh, simple psych book. And if we can tighten up even more on just that graph, that's what I want to actually show you. Um,
some really interesting things are happening during adolescence when we speak physiologically. First of all, the neural system is still at 100%, no change. Body size is going to go up, but the reproductive organs are going to go from 10 or 15% of adult size to full 100% adult size uh, by age to 18, 20, or 22. Um, look at what's happened to the lymphatic system. Actually, at the beginning of adolescence, the lymphatic system is typically at about twice adult size proportionally in the body indicating that it does in fact play a role in initiating the onset of, of uh, puberty and adolescent effects and it takes a while for those effects to settle out but that's the only system in the entire body which is actually growing smaller during adolescence it, it is reducing itself proportionally to what becomes adult size but proportionally in the body it's about 200 percent of adult size now what i want to do then is to shift and look at an issue related to a couple of those areas of change. One has to do with um, weight. And in essence, the shift in weight that takes place is surprising. The adolescent growth spurt, as you can see on the screen here, is a, is a significant increase in, in, um, in body size. There's no mistaking that. But I want to point out to you the amount of change that is taking place in the weeks immediately following birth. I would argue that that change in, in weight is even more significant than the, the relatively minor adolescent growth spurt. And I want to point out to you here that what's plotted here is not a percentage figure on the y-axis. That is an absolute change figure that is represented there. That is, you are adding weight as an infant at least as fast as you are as an adolescent. And I would argue those curves are actually slightly above what the adolescent achieves later on in life. With Vijay, he was born at about six pounds, eight ounces, about six and a half pounds at birth. By three months of age, he had more than doubled his weight. He was at 13 pounds and change by the time he was three months old. Sit there for a minute and contemplate what it would take for you to double your weight between now and three months from today. Imagine what you'd have to do to your diet to actually double your weight in three months. And yet that's what the average infant does within the first three months after birth. I mean, it's just, it's a staggering change, particularly when you keep in mind that that's, a, that's, that's an absolute change in weight that's plotted here. It is a little less obvious when we look not at weight, but at height. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It's actually more obvious when you look at height as to what's going on. And both of those, again, I want to point out, if you check the, the left axis, are absolute changes. I'm not plotting proportional changes. I'm plotting absolute changes in, in height and weight that take place. So the adolescent growth spurt, in some ways, is a real afterthought to the changes that go on in, in, uh, in childhood. And yet, it is nonetheless a very significant set of changes that are, that are occurring there. To give you a more specific example of what we're talking about here, this is a group of youngsters that I photographed out at Stanford the year I was on leave out there. Um, and it's a swim club uh, where the members were practicing. Sadly, for my purposes uh, and the purposes of the photograph, the oldest members, the most mature members of the club were not actually there that day. They were out at, at a competition out of the city. Um, but which, so what you've got here are kind of the B, C, and D level teams or representatives of them. What I did was to gather young ladies and young men who were within three months of, of the same age of each other and then simply asked them to, to pose for this photograph. And I think you, can, you would agree that we've got about the same range of relative immaturity to relative maturity in this particular uh, photograph here. The thing that I want to point out to you in addition to the range is the fact that those youngsters are 27 months apart in their birthday. The boys becoming men in that picture are 27 months older than the girls who are pictured. Okay? That is the point in, in human life when you and I, male and female, are most separated from one another, is at the beginning of adolescence, at the beginning of the adolescent growth spurt. Girls go into that much earlier than do boys, and in fact there's literature to indicate that they are continuing because of, of nutrition and medicine to go in earlier and earlier and earlier. Net result is that if you want to see a truly macabre experience, go chaperone a sixth grade dance. And there you will be likely to see a fully mature sixth grade girl slash woman dancing with a massively underdeveloped shrimpy boy to become man. Because sadly they're both the same age in sixth grade and the girls are way ahead of us boys in that process of maturation. 
that's one reason, though, that, that we have uh, unisex uh, athletic programs perfectly logical in elementary school. Up until the beginnings of, of the separations that occur by age, um, there's no reason not to have little boys and little girls competing head to head against one another because we are both, as, as our various sexes, equally competitive and, and equally athletic with proper training. By the time you get to be adults, or in fact uh, junior high, um, there is an obvious reason to separate because uh, boys begin to start getting heavier um, than girls do. And for that reason, uh, the, the split is, is a logical one uh, to do. But some rather interesting implications don't follow through from that. One is the fact that basically, um, the, for years and years, the, um, the three minute, uh, four minute mile was considered to be impossible. And then all of a sudden, many years ago, Roger Bannister blew that record, did a, did a mile in under four minutes, and all of a sudden, he was a world hero. But now it's down, the, the men's record is down around 350, three minutes and 50 seconds to run a mile. And people don't think about that anymore. If it's 359, hey, kind of slow today. Um, for women, I guess what I'm suggesting then is that the male's curve of performance is flattening out in all of the run events. And if you look at the breaking of records, the time intervals are getting longer and longer and the times are beginning to flatten out on all of the major events. Not so with the women. Particularly on the longer runs, the 5,000 and 10,000 meter runs and the, the, um, um, the marathons, uh, the 26 milers, those lengths, are, those times are continuing for women to improve. And I read one sports article six months or a year ago where the person had actually laid out what's happened to the, to the times, men versus women. And the projection is of that sports authority that in fact the women's times are eventually going to equal and potentially exceed the, um, or better be shorter than the, the men's times, particularly on the longer distances. So I can see what's going to come is that someday when we run a marathon, we'll have the men's times and the women's times combined. That is, we won't separate it. And then what's going to happen, I'll predict and I'll be dead before it happens, is that we men are going to be beaten all the time and we're going to insist on separate times. So we'll have men and women again. But then what's going to happen is the women will be running faster than the men are. Mark my words, and none of you are going to be around to see that happen because the curves kind of project for a ways. But, but there are some rather interesting things that come out of studying even physiology in, um, in um, elementary school. Now let's look at another uh, area where there's been some rather interesting activity among adolescents. And that is the um, moral development. That is uh, essentially how we go about combining reasoning and feeling and action, particularly in controversial situations. One of the more interesting theories was developed by Lawrence Kohlberg. Um, in, in starting in the 60s and with research that ran on for about 30 years, um, he basically defined um, six stages or types of moral development that he thought we engaged in. Um, and he did so by using stories like the following. One of them was, in Europe, a woman was near death from cancer. One drug might savor a form of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. The druggist was charging $2,000, which was 10 times what the drug cost him to make. The sick woman's husband went to everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get together about half of what it cost. He told the druggist that his wife was dying and asked the druggist to sell it cheaper or let him pay later, but the druggist refused. The druggist said no. The husband got desperate and broke into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. Should the husband have done that, why? Kohlberg doesn't care whether you answer yes or no to that particular query. What he's interested in is the logic that you use to justify the response that you give. In the premoral stage, stage one, that is the least sophisticated. That's essentially a kind of a black-white logic that is used, and essentially right is defined simply by praise and punishment. So you might hear somebody in premoral stage one argue, yeah, go ahead and steal the drug because you could do it at night and you could get away with it. Um, or you might hear them argue, no, you should not steal because the store, the, the, the drugstore probably has a, uh, a burglar alarm and if you, if you break in, the alarm will go off and the police will catch you. So right and wrong is defined strictly in terms of it's okay to do it if you don't get caught, it's not okay to do it if you do get caught. Kohlberg himself gave a seminar here at the university about four or five, six years ago before his suicide death. And within that seminar, the way he presented the theory, I thought was really quite instructive and, and helpful. What he suggested was that you think in terms of the theory as involving increasing what he called circles of influence 
the older you become and the more sophisticated your thinking becomes. So that basically premoral stage one involves you and nobody else but you. Okay? Stage two involves basically you and the, the wife in that particular example. Here what, we're, what we might hear is something like at the time of marriage they, they, performed a, um, they performed a social ceremony in which each agreed to love, honor, cherish, and respect the other individual um, and to protect. And so the net result is that if she's sick, it's his responsibility now to do his job, to protect her, to, to help her. Um, or there might be other logic that we use to, to suggest that, uh, no, we, we're going to, we've pledged to obey the laws and, and should not, therefore, um, do the robbery under, under that uh, circumstance. Stage three involves what is called conventional logic. Now what you're going to do is to see that what pleases others becomes very important. Parents and peers are often used as a reference group. So in terms of the family, instead of having the immediate family, you might think of it as, as kind of the extended family. The parents, the parents-in-law, the brothers, the sisters, the children, the, the broader family group is, is used to justify whichever decision is, is, decide, is defined. Stage four is basically going to involve a strict adherence to ruler, rules. I sometimes refer to this as the Archie Bunker stage. In essence here, um, it's, it's a, a, a logic that tries to maintain social order and respect for authority, but it's a kind of a top-down use of the law. Archie Bunker, for instance, might appeal to forensic law and, and say essentially, no, the laws of the land say you don't steal, so you don't steal. He should not steal the drug. Or he might appeal to religious law in which case he would argue, well, of course the, the husband should steal because a human life is worth more than a druggist's um, monthly profit. Uh, so of course you would steal. But it's a kind of a top-down analysis. That is the law as ultimate authority that is going on there. By the time you get to stage five, and I've gone through stage four into stage five, um, now what you're dealing with is what's called principled reasoning. Um, Kohlberg himself acknowledged that he has trouble or had trouble maintaining the difference between stage five and stage six. But in stage five, what you're emphasizing essentially is, is majority will and welfare. Um, that is, what you're trying to do is, is to develop personal standards of responsibility and couch the decision in that context. Stage six, then, would involve balanced relations uh, between humans. Um, where what you're dealing with, you could think of it if you want essentially as kind of the application of, of Christianity's golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or comparable rules from any of the other um, major world religions. The idea there is kind of the ultimate cost-benefit analysis. You want to maximize the return to both the individual and to society as a whole. That is a much more sophisticated form of, um, of analysis. In your, um, in your book there, you have a, um, a curve, and unfortunately I don't have a slide for that either, I believe, um, which shows you essentially the, um, the, a curve involving the, um, the age at which each of those styles of, of uh, reasoning is actually used. And if we can just tighten in on that graph alone, um, in essence, what that graph is suggesting is that, that by the time of early adolescence, the, the developmental processes are pretty well complete. That is, um, where all of us are in, engaged in premoral logic initially, subsequently, by the time we enter adolescence, we are remarkably stable. The 20% of us engage in principled logic, 60% of us engage in conventional logic, and another 20% engage in premoral logic. There are some fools on the interstate, even today, driving, who will not let you merge with oncoming traffic. Um, they are legally breaking the law when they do that. Somebody on the interstate is legally required to, to allow you to merge. Lean out the window and tell them that the next time that happens. But, but um, there is evidence of premoral logic um, when we look at um, the behavior of adult humans. A couple of other things that are interesting relative to this theory. One is that Kohlberg himself always maintained that you function at a given level, period. Let me pose a problem for you. At the at, at, uh, in the neighborhood where I used to live on off West Belford, there was a place where a residential road crossed West Belford with a traffic light. If I was coming home at night at 3 in the morning and that traffic light is red and I can see half a mile both directions on West Belford and there's nobody moving, am I going to wait for that light? Would you? I wouldn't. I would run it and did. Would I do it with a policeman there? Not a prayer. So I'm clearly rationalizing that at the level of, of stage one. But I would like to think, and you probably would also agree, that you lead your lives at a much more sophisticated level. So that's an argument. Are we always at one level, or is that just the maximum level that we can reach?